Good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, Chancellor. Uh, so Torsten has just told us that Britain just needs to what, sort yourself out. So you are, at least for the moment, the man in charge of sorting out Britain's economy. Um, this book... I don't like that, at least for the moment, Manny. <laughs> Can we just rewind and uh, say, um, subject to the next election? Subject to the next election. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, this book, you probably haven't had a chance to read all of it, but it is uh, really good, meaty, and quite sobering. Um, the headline, Torsten just laid out the headlines, but you know these. Um, basically, we've had 15 years of stagnation. Productivity growth has fallen off a cliff since the financial crisis, less than half that of our OECD peers. Real wages basically stagnant. Something's gone terribly wrong. And your government, your party, has been in government for most of that time. So I think I want to have most of this conversation looking forward, but I do think it's worth understanding what's gone wrong. And so I'd love to hear your view of why we are in this mess. Why has productivity fallen so much? And frankly, what could the government have done differently? How much blame should really be laid at the hand of government decisions? Well, it's a, a good question to open with. And first of all, I, I haven't read this from cover to cover because it's only been published this morning, but I have read a summary of it. And I think it's uh, a really interesting report that's asking all the right questions. Um, but I think uh, I fundamentally and profoundly disagree <laughs> with Torsten's view uh, that, you know, the great advantage of doing badly, which I just heard him use those words, of, of things going wrong, ignores the context. I mean, what we had was the worst financial crisis since the Second World War, which affected lots of countries, not just our country. And since 2010, we've actually grown faster than Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, Germany, Japan. In fact, the majority of the countries that Torsten was comparing us to. We've grown faster than them. So I think it's absolutely right to say why have all of us fallen into this uh, low growth uh, paradigm and what can we do to get out of it? Um, but I don't think uh, this is something that we are uniquely in a bad situation uh, with respect to. I think this is affecting all Western nations and you have to have a plan to get out of it. Okay, uh, we're not going to argue too much about the numbers, but we have been doing significantly worse if you look at living standards over the last 15 years. Just to go back to my question, is there anything that, with hindsight, you would have done differently? Well, there are lots of things that you learn, of course, over time. But, um, uh, you know, I th with living standards, right, the, and where I absolutely agree with this report is that productivity is key. So the only way in the long run that you can raise living standards is by raising productivity. Now, I don't blame the Resolution Foundation for the fact that they went to print days before the autumn statement, but we did introduce in the autumn statement uh, the most competitive business investment release in the world, matched only amongst OECD countries by Latvia and Estonia with full expensing. Um, this means, and alongside uh, another 109 growth measures, this will increase business investment in the British economy by 20 billion a year. And that is about half the gap with, you know, Torsten looked at the, the countries we like to compare ourselves to. But if you take Germany, France, and America, they invest about 2% of GDP more than we do every year. Um, and those measures, including full expensing, but not just full expensing, the, the reforms to the planning system, uh, the increasing access to the grid for clean energy projects, that 20 billion a year closes about half the gap with France, Germany, and America. In one fiscal event, I think that's not bad going. And so I think we, we are really focused on productivity. Um, but if I could just, while I'm answering that, I think there is one gap here, and I... I do think it's, uh, as we're talking about this report, I think I should just mention it. Um, because um, I, if I was going to choose one country in the world that had the most untapped potential to become the most prosperous 21st century economy, it would be Britain. And why is that? Um, because, first, we are very good at introspection, and this is a very good example of that, so we do ask ourselves the searching questions. But most of all, because... The sectors that are going to grow the fastest this century are the sectors where we are doing 
really well in. Technology is the obvious one, where we have a technology sector that's double the size of Germany, is three times the size of France. If you ask why it is that we've grown faster than Germany since 2010, despite their higher productivity, it is because we are actually stronger on innovation. So if we could solve the productivity bit, there would be no stopping us. And the reason I think that is, if I, with the greatest respect, could say that is an omission, is because you'd spend a lot of time rightly talking about our strengths in the service sectors. If you'd done an equivalent report in the 1980s and not mentioned Big Bang and the City of London, um, which has gone on to be an area of global leadership for the UK, you'd be ignoring the sector that, whose taxes now fund half the cost of the NHS, because that's what financial services do. So I think you, you have to think about technology, AI, life sciences, clean energy, uh, creative industries, because those are the sectors that are going to be really important for us going forward. Why don't you elaborate on that? Because one of the messages that comes out strongly from the report is the need for a growth strategy. And you, you know, as you say, you unveiled 110 measures. 110 measures is a huge number of measures. It's, I'm not sure, though, I understand what the growth strategy is of this government. Well, in fairness to the Resolution Foundation, that was the autumn statement. So I was focusing on, on the autumn statement last year. It was stabilisation and the battle against inflation. The spring budget was labour supply. That was where we had the childcare measures. The autumn statement was growth. Um, I, I spent an hour giving that statement. I won't do the same thing again. But if I was going no, to say two things... The yeah, no, no, the strategy. Not the details. The big, what's yeah. the 30-second pitch? What is the growth pitch, strategy? 30-second pitch. Number one, you've got to deal with productivity by increasing business investment, and that is why we had full expensing... Uh, and that's why we had those, those £20 billion of measures. Secondly, you've got to have a very clear view as to where our competitive advantage is. And the country which has got, outside the United States, the most respected higher education sector, outside the United States, uh, the biggest financial services sector, our strength is innovation industries. And that is where, if we are focused, uh, this... Uh, Conservative administration can give the country uh, a world beating technology sector, the world's next Silicon Valley, just in the same way that Nigel Lawson gave the country the City of London and financial services. And so that is, I think, you put those two things together. And I think you've got, and by the way, I should add into productivity, it's not just business investment, it's also skills, which is why the Prime Minister's plan for teaching people maths to 18 is really important because. You know, 15% of our school leavers leave school without the necessary math skills. It's only 8% in Singapore. We need to close that gap. So I think you would find a lot of commonality with what you've just laid out in the report. Um, you focused on the need for more investment, private and public. We'll get to public in a second, but let's talk about private investment. The bulk of capital spending in this country is done by businesses. You introduced, as you say, full expensing. That would have got a three, three stars from the report. They said you should do it. You've already done it. Um, Beyond full expensing, what is holding private investment in this country back? You, you've run a business. Why don't businesses here invest more? And what can you do beyond full expensing to, to improve that? Well, lots of things, but um, let me give you uh, three. Um, first of all, labour supply. Most businesses find it hard to expand because they can't recruit the staff. And that's why we are now... But we have, six, we have one million vacancies in the economy we have six million adults of working age who are not in work. And that's why we announced uh, in the autumn statement some very big labour market reforms, welfare reforms, that are designed to bring... Many of those people would like to come back into work, and uh, we need to have a system that doesn't write people off if they have an illness or a disability, but says the first thing we're going to do is try and treat you, which is why... Uh, we're going to be funding a lot more people to do talking therapies, um, helping half a million people with mental health conditions because that's an increasing reason why people are uh, leaving their jobs. So that would be one of them. Another is a total overhaul of our planning system. So we said that, you know, what local councils say is that they don't have enough planning staff uh, and we need to remove cost as an issue for them. So we've said that local authorities, when it comes to business planning applications can charge their full cost, full cost recovery, in return for which they must process an application within the statutory period, and if they don't, they have to give the money back and still process it at high speed. So that's 
That's a very big one. And then the third one, because clean energy is such a big part of our transformation, we're going to have to double the amount of electricity that we generate as a country. Um, we totally transformed the way businesses are going to be able to access the national grid because um, one of the things that's holding back clean energy investment is people are being told they have to wait 14 years for a grid connection and we're going to shrink. I think we're going to reduce the delays by 90% as a result of what I announced. So those are all really impressive changes. Um, I think across the board people would probably applaud them, but they are new approaches from the government. And one of the challenges, I think, for businesses is the, the frequency and speed with which policy changes. I mean, it's unbelievably volatile. I'm going to quote now from the report. Lower level instability since 2010 has included nine business secretaries, four versions of the business department, too many industrial strategies or growth plans to count. Corporation tax has changed almost annually. How can, you know, a government, and, and we've had the same party in power and there's been that much change. How worrying, and you, you, you must deal with this day in, day out. How do you recognize the sense that volatility and policy uncertainty is a problem? And how do you guard against that? I mean, we've got an election coming, but assuming, let's, let's just assume that you, you are in power for the next five years. How do you get a plan in place that people can say, right, we're sticking with this? Well, I think there's a very particular reason why we've had that um, political chopping and changing. I don't think it's a good thing. By the way, you're talking to the, as you know, the longest serving health secretary. I was there for nearly six years. And I think um, there are enormous benefits to ministers staying in their post for a long period of time. But um, we had Brexit. That led to a hung parliament. That led to a politically incredibly challenging time where um, the British people had voted to leave the EU, but parliament couldn't agree on how, and ultimately to the fall of Theresa May's government. Um, and then we had a pandemic. Um, and these things have led to changes in Whitehall. I hope we can have more stability going forward, absolutely, because I think it is a better thing for policy. So that's the political side. What about the institutional side? Um, as you know, we, we wrote a big piece about the Treasury recently, arguing that actually the Treasury, while it has many strengths, was perhaps institutionally a problem for growth because it was short-termist. How much do you recognise that analysis? Um, I think that the... you know I. I, I generally find myself agreeing with most of what you write in The Economist, um, but um, that one I thought uh, didn't... I, I thought it was, a, it was a fair point historically. So I think the Treasury has been historically uh, first and foremost an accountant determined to make sure the books balance, which is very important in the international markets because, you know, people have to know we're good for our debts and uh, we pay lower debt interest rates as a result of the confidence people have. Um, but I think the Treasury since I've been there, by the way, it's not because of me, but my impression of the Treasury since I've been there has been a very growth-focused organisation. And, you know, they started the day after the spring budget, we started working on the autumn statement. I said this is going to be a, a, an autumn statement on growth and very specifically unlocking business investment. That is, what, that is the thing that we are going to try and crack in the autumn statement. And I think they did an absolutely superb job. So I think that now, I think if you, you, know, if you looked in the Treasury, there is an understanding of the centrality of growth uh, to what they do. Now, some people say you should remove the responsibility for growth to another government department, perhaps have a, a department for economics or something like that, which other countries do. I would say that the problem with that is that in any political system, ultimately power resides where the money is. And you don't want the department that's responsible for growth uh, to have to negotiate for its budget every year with the Treasury. At the moment, when there's something that's really important for growth, such as you know securing the gigafactory in Somerset that um, JLR Land Rover Tata announced, you know, I think it's very important the Chancellor thinks that's my job to make sure we secure this kind of investment for the UK. And so I think there are very big advantages in having that responsibility for growth uh, where the money is. So you want a powerful Treasury, but one that is focused on growth? Absolutely. What about then public investment? And this, this is a, a gathering of largely economists, so they won't <coughs> mind me focusing so much on investment, because as the report says, it's completely integral. And public investment, 20% of total investment, the report says public investment should increase dramatically. 
towards the 3% of GDP they're saying should become the norm. If you look, and I, you know, the only thing we have to go on for your plans for the next five years were you to have them would be the autumn statement. And if you look there, you actually have real public investment declining. Is it sensible to have declining public investment? Um, I don't think you want declining public investment. Um, and I very much hope we'll be able to get back into a place where we don't have to do that. But I think it's also important to say, Zanny, that in uh, 2020, uh, the capital budget, which is the closest proxy you have to public investment, went up by its highest ever level, by 21%, from £70 billion to £100 billion. That's it. So we are now spending, in terms of public capital spending, £30 billion a year more in real terms. But it's still, you know, it's risen as a share of GDP, but it's, if you, you've got it on a trajectory, it's gone up and it's then going to go down. Well, hang on. Just, let's just explain exactly what happened. So in that 2020 budget, when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor, it was the biggest ever increase. Now, I then had to balance the books a year ago. It was an incredibly difficult situation, um, but it was necessary for the markets and it was necessary for the battle against inflation. So what I chose to do was to freeze that capital budget in cash terms, which is not a freeze in real terms. I hope as soon as we can afford to, we can get back to real terms growth, but I'm absolutely committed to public investment. And I think the evidence I would give you if I may, that we are committed to public investment, was that, as, as everyone knows, we had a very big challenge with HS2, and uh, the, the project was going wrong. Now, I think in previous eras, if the Treasury had lived up to what you were describing in the article about it in The Economist, we would have clawed that money back to help balance the books in other areas. But actually, every single penny of that $36 billion that we save from not proceeding with HS2 is being put into other capital projects. So we are absolutely committed to investment in the public realm. And I think the way, how do you get there? You get there by unleashing the growth in the economy more broadly. And that's what I was trying let's, to do in the autumn but, statement. But let's, let's sort of stand back a bit because this is a report written in 2030. And you know, you have in, in uh, as Chancellor, at least on the public finances, you have a few levers, right? You've got taxes and you've got spending and with tw between spending you can you've got current spending and you've got capital spending and I'm crudely simplifying but basically you have cut taxes you have you, you're going to have public public current spending falling very dramatically after 24 25 and you've got net investment going down too what do you think is the right approach you've said you want more public investment does that mean you want to have you know even bigger cuts in current spending or do you want higher taxes because you, you kind of can't have all three. Well, you can have all three if you do them in the right order. And I think it's wrong to say, uh, it's wrong to just <laughs> describe the package of measures that I did as cutting taxes without saying what those taxes were cut for. So I did two major tax cuts in the autumn statement. One was um, int introduction of full expensing, which the CBI said was a game changer that was going to fire up the British economy, gives us the most competitive capital allowances. All the countries that Torsten were talking about that invest more than we do, uh, none of them have as competitive a regime as, as we do. And just to underline the significance of that measure, um, Rishi Sunak announced a precursor of that in, I think, 2021 with the super deduction. Uh, I then continued it with uh, temporary full expensing for three years in the spring budget. It's now permanent full expensing. Since we started on this journey, since Rishi Sunak started on this journey, business investment has grown by more in this country than America, France, Germany, any of the countries in Torsten's list. So that's one, one tax cut. The second tax cut was the cut in national insurance, um, which the OBR themselves say will bring 94,000 people back into the workforce, full-time equivalent. That is equivalent to filling one in 10 of the vacancies across the whole country. That is a, a totally pro-growth tax cut. So how do we invest in the public realm? How do we make sure that, you know, that our public finances match up? It's by getting the country growing. And this is a strategy. These are tax cuts that will stimulate growth, not in my words, but in the words of the CBI, the OBR, and other independent commentators. So. 
I, I want to get our horizons to, to 2030 again. And I, I'm, because I'm mindful that the report makes very clear that you need a broad strategy. As, am I unfairly summarizing you if I, because I've heard you say basically Britain was hit by shocks that others were, so kind of not our fault. Now we're going to have a strategy that is tax cuts and you know, as much public investment in we, as we can afford, but nothing fundamentally different. You don't see a need for any sort of bigger, broader policy changes of the scope that <coughs> this lays out. Well, I, I think that's, that is a mischaracterization. Is it? Okay, good. It is. I mean, you're ignoring the fact that we made some very, very big changes in the autumn statement, giving us some of the most competitive business taxes in the world. Um, and you're characterizing tax cuts as a strategy in isolation. I do believe in tax cuts. I'm a conservative. I would like to reduce the, um, the size of the state as a proportion of GDP. But the tax cuts that I'm doing are pro-growth tax cuts that are going to fire up the British economy. And, um, you know, I think what I've done is something that will be transformative in terms of our productivity, which is exactly what this report is arguing. I mean, you know, the report is also very powerful in talking about the regional inequality that we have in this country. The fact that the productivity gap between London and Manchester is 40% when it's only 20% between Paris and Lyon. And uh, the levelling up strategy is square on designed to deal with that. And since we started that in 2019, two thirds of all new employed jobs have been outside <coughs> London and the South East. So I think that is beginning to have an impact. Um, but I, are there more things we can do? Absolutely. I think in every fiscal event I've done, I've demonstrated that I'm prepared to do big new things, whether, it was, whether it's the childcare measures in the spring budget or full expensing in, in this budget, that will help transform our growth prospects. Just a couple more questions from me and then questions from you. So do get ready because there are people wandering around with, with microphones. One on planning. You, you laid out some very ambitious planning reforms in the, in the autumn statement. You've, you've said very clearly that you think that's an important part of uh, faster growth. But your party seems to be kind of increasingly opposed both to whether it's new pylons or solar farms or indeed house building. I mean, how do you... Can you credibly say the Conservative Party is the party of growth, given those factors? Well, you, every party has to um, manage its own parliamentary party, sometimes getting through measures that are not popular. But look at our track record. In, in the last year for which we have um, house building numbers, which is uh, the year before, well, it's the year ending March uh, 22, uh, we had more new homes completed than in any single year under the previous Labour government. So we have seen a big increase. But what we've also seen over the last five to seven years is increasingly strong environmental protections. And we have got to find a way of getting the balance right between those two. And so we will continue to find ways to reform the planning system. Uh, we are going to see more, um, you know, more clean energy projects in our natural landscapes if we're going to double the amount of electricity we generate. That's a choice that we make as a country, but it's the right thing to do uh, for the planet as well as for the economy. So we are going to see some changes. Um, but I think that, um, you know, what I would say is the planning measures that we announced in the autumn statement alone are going to unlock £9 billion of annual additional investment. Uh, so I think they were very significant. One more complete different track, benefits. One of the powerful messages of this report is that it is the combination of slow productivity growth and high inequality. And one of the things that has clearly really hit incomes at the bottom of the income distribution has been the changes in benefits that have come over the last 12 years. Do you think, would you agree with the report in, in arguing that there needs to be a fundamental change there for this to be inclusive growth? I totally agree that it needs to be inclusive growth. But, um, and I haven't read the specific bits in that report. I, I would say this, though, about um, what has actually happened. If you look at the, which part of, which group, group of people in the economy 
have seen their post-tax real incomes grow the most since 2010. It's not the people at the top. Um, it's not the people at the very bottom. It is the people who are working full-time on the national living wage. They have seen the threshold at which they start to pay tax or national insurance double. They have seen the national living wage go up massively, and it's gone up again in the autumn statement. Uh, that group of people has actually seen their post-tax real income increase by 30% since 2010. It's a huge increase. And why is that? Because we want to incentivize people to get back into work, those 6 million adults who are not working. And in terms of the poverty impact, the people in absolute poverty after housing costs has gone down uh, since 2010 by 1.7 million people, including 400,000 children. Um, and that is because we have reduced workless households. So I think they're all connected. I do passionately think we, we need to be an inclusive society in which everyone has a share in growth. But if you look at some of the uh, societies that are often characterised as being more equal than ours, someone like the Netherlands, for example, um, they actually have lower inactivity rates, higher employment rates. If we had the same number of women in work as they have in Holland relative to the size of population, we would have two million more people in work in the UK. So we would have filled every vacancy in the economy twice over. That's true. It's, but it's, it's worth reading that bit because they're pretty, pretty sobering statistics. That you know, low-income households in the UK are now 27% poorer than their French and German counterparts. And that gap has widened over the last 13 years. Let's, well, you and I could go on for a long time. Let's hear some questions from the audience. Um, yes, right there. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack Gamble, uh, Director of the Campaign for the Arts. Um, Chancellor, the Resolution Foundation's report today agrees with the government that the creative and cultural industries are a main uh, growth area of, of potential for the UK economy. And the report says that the UK's creative strengths can be traced to cultural openness, high quality creative education, and the role that public service broadcasting via both the BBC and Channel 4 has in shaping the market. Our research has found that uh, there have been declines of 47% at GCSE and 29% at A-level in creative subjects in England. And I noticed in the news today there's talk of potentially further reductions in the funding of the BBC. My question to you is, you've said that you want to get growth up first to get public uh, investment up second. But are you not concerned that these real declines, including in public investment, might actually be draining the fuel out of one of our key economic engines? Um, I, first of all, I totally agree with the report that our innate creativity is why the creative industry is one of the five sectors that I've identified as being an area of national competitive comparative advantage. Um, and it, it's interesting. We have, in the last decade, we've become the largest film and TV production centre in Europe. In fact, we may have already been that, but we've extended <coughs> our lead over other European countries. And film and TV production in the last uh, four years, I don't think there's any evidence of what you said, because actually our studio space has gone up by two-thirds. Netflix alone has spent £6 billion pounds in the UK. Um, and we have uh, attracted those industries here because of uh, very generous tax reliefs. But they can see that they can source the skills they need to, you know, to make Barbie or Oppenheimer, both of which are made here. They can source those here. But I think the really interesting thing is that film and TV and creative interests have become an offshoot of the technology industry in the last uh, decade um, because basically it is all, you know, special effects is all about technology. And what you get in the UK is the tech skills and also the creativity come together, you've got a combination of Hollywood and Silicon Valley, which is absolutely incredible. So um, we are absolutely back in them. I would never be complacent about skills. There's always more we can do. And I couldn't agree with you more about public service broadcasting being central to what makes the UK attractive. Thank you. Let's go uh, somewhere in the back there. Yes, let me come to you. Hi, I'm Juliet from Christians Against Poverty. Um, our recent research has highlighted that we've got 9% of the UK population having debt they don't know how to repay, and we provide debt support, and 50% of our clients have deficit budgets. 
So just wondering kind of what um, support you're considering which would help people uh, in emergency crisis situations now to make sure that we don't end up with a debt crisis next. Thank you. I think a couple of things. First of all, um, we're very concerned about people with mortgages as interest rates have gone up, ending up not being able to pay their mortgages. So I, I organised something called the Mortgage Charter, which 90% of lenders have signed, or 90% of the market by volume has signed up to, which does things like uh, guarantee that all people will be given a year's grace before any repossession proceedings happen, um, enables people to move to a best possible deal at the last moment. Um, and uh, we're still seeing uh, significantly fewer. I think it's still, repossessions are still a, a third the level they were um, just after the financial crisis. So um, I think it's having some impact. But I think the other thing any chancellor has to do in a, in a fiscal event is ask what direct levers you have. So one of the things that we did at the autumn statement was uh, increase the local housing allowance, which is basically going to be an £800 uh, grant to 1.4 million households because we know rents going up is one of the biggest pressures on poorer households. So I think it's a balance of things. Thank you. Yes. Three rows back. Paul Swinney from the Think Tank Centre for Cities. Um, Chancellor, you said that we uh, have a real specialism in, in innovative industries uh, but have a productivity uh, problem. My view would be that it's those innovative industries that are meant to push productivity on. So just wondering what your diagnosis is between the disconnect between specialised in these cutting edge uh, sectors and yet still having a productivity problem. Um, well, I think there'll be lots of economists here who have studied what the definition of productivity is um, uh, and will be more knowledgeable than I am about it. But I think my understanding of what drives productivity is it's, it's a combination of human capital, things like skills, which is why it's so important that we invest in our education system and why it's such a positive thing that educational standards are going up. It's a combination of business investment, whereas Torsten was telling you earlier, we have traditionally lagged, and that's what the autumn statement measures were all about. Um, it's to do with regional disparities, which is why the levelling up uh, agenda is, is so important. I mean, it's also to do with this thing called total factor productivity, which includes things like your ability to innovate. Um, and I think that uh, we are very strong on that bit. We've been weaker on the capital investment side. And for, for a long time, our education side, we've been very good on the sort of university educated half of school leavers, less good on the school leavers who don't go to university. And I think that is now really changing. I think we've got time for a couple more. So, yes, lady there, four rows back. Five rows back, yeah, there, two. Yeah. Francis Coppola, Independent Economist. Um, really a follow-on from the last question I wanted to ask about productivity. Um, much of the rhetoric that we've heard has been about getting more people into work, but I would like to remind you that getting more people into work is not the same as increasing productivity. Um, so my question would be, given that your the two particular um, policies you've highlighted in your discourse has been full expensing, absolutely, that's a good policy, and a cut to national insurance to get more people into work, what are your strategies for raising productivity rather than just increasing the size of the workforce? Well, um, the, the two are connected, but... Um you know, 94,000 more, the workforce, the national workforce will increase by 94,000 as a result of the national insurance cut, which as I say, is about one in 10 of all vacancies. Um, and how do we make sure that those people are able to work productively? It's by incentivizing their employers to invest more in capital, plant, machinery, IT systems, so that each individual worker is generating more output. Germany has productivity 15% higher than us. So at the moment, uh, broadly speaking, it takes Germans four days, what it takes a Brit five days to work. That isn't because Germans work longer hours or work harder. It's because 
uh, by and large, German workers have more capital wrapped around them, more machinery, more plant, more automation, which means that they have higher productivity. So that's why um, introducing capital allowances, full expensing, that is more generous than Germany's, is the way that we're going to see more investment alongside reforms to the planning system and other measures. So you need to do the, the two together. One more question. Yes, gentleman there, the turquoise sweater. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by our attitude to the economy. I kind of want to touch on that with an analogy. If I think about the first session from Torsten, it's almost like he's described an economy that has a, a, a broken leg. And then I come, come to this session and it sounds like you're my chief surgeon who's telling me, I'm not sure you have a broken leg actually. Um, maybe we don't need to do anything or you know, maybe we need to just carry on as is or maybe we need to invest here or there. To what degree does our economy actually have a broken leg? And to what do we do need do we need to repair it before we then have ambitions of prospering <laughs> highly and running a two-hour marathon? That is a great analogy. And, and you are a marathon runner, no? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the perfect metaphor here. <laughs> um, but um, look, I think it's, it's really important not to lose our self-belief. And I think that we are uh, one of the world's best and most brilliant countries are beating ourselves up because we have brilliant magazines like The Economist who are good at Flattery putting, will get you nowhere. Who are good at putting us under a magnifying glass <laughs> and identifying areas where I'm not sure I describe it as a broken leg, but identifying areas where we can do better. And that is that is a very good thing for us that we do that. But sometimes we forget that other countries also have the things that they need to improve. Um, you know, I have to you know, I, I've had conversations with European finance ministers who say they wish they could swap our education system for theirs because they look at our universities, four of the world's top 20. Nowhere else outside America gets close to that. And um, we, you look at our technology industry, um, you look at our record on climate change where we've cut emissions by 49%, France has cut them by 23%. And so we do, we've done lots of things really well. Um, we should absolutely be honest about the things that we can do better. Our technical education for school leavers who don't go to university has come on leaps and bounds, but we need to go further. That's why we need people to be doing maths and English till they're 18. Our productivity is still behind France, Germany, and the United States. We need a plan for that, which is what I announced. But what we shouldn't lose is the fact that, you know, despite uh, lots of venerable magazines saying that we're going to hell in a handcart, we always confound expectations in this country, and we always do far better than everyone says. And a year ago, all these experts were saying that the economy was going to contract. You know, the OBR said it was going to contract by 1.4%. It's actually grown by 0.6%. That's a 2% difference in just, just one year. And I think we shouldn't lose confidence that we do some things absolutely amazingly. I know he's controversial in other ways, um, but you know when Elon Musk was here three weeks ago, he said there were only two centers in the world for AI, San Francisco and London. So this is a guy who you know, is spending a lot of money on AI and knows about automation and you know he's... he's He's done Tesla, and he, he, he knows this stuff very, very well. So we've got a lot going for us. So if we're going to go into um, dealing with the, um, the sprained ankle rather than the broken leg, <laughs> um, then let's do so from a perspective of positivity because we've got so much going for us, um, and, uh, and I think we should you know, have a little bit of optimism for the future because uh, this has still got some of the most exciting prospects of any country in the world. Okay, so let's, as a last question, let's, let's grant you that optimism. I like the sprained ankle uh, analogy. Um, what will this potential marathon running country with a temporarily sprained ankle look like in 2030? Just paint a picture of what, in the, in the best possible case, where all the things that you would like to happen get done, what does the country look like, and what are the three or four things that you would need to do between now and then to get it there? Okay. Um, well, the first thing is, um, you know, we have an election next year, 
and we have to make the right choice at that election. And, um, and it's interesting, because one of the things that you, you tried to suggest I was saying, I know you don't really think I was saying it, Zanny, but it was a nice try, it was that uh, I was trying to say, it's fine to do more of the same. Absolutely not. We're making really big changes. But one of the things that we have won, is won back, is a reputation for fiscal probity. And, it is, and you're, you're going to talk to Keir Starmer this afternoon. It is not possible to meet our fiscal rule to reduce debt in five years and to increase borrowing by £28 billion a year. One of those two has to be false. So I hope whatever the country decides next year, we do not relinquish our reputation for fiscal probity. Um, and then what I would say is, and I think this is the, um, this is the bit where I, I, I totally agree with the economist analysis of what needs to happen in, in politics. Um, it's really important that we're long term. The benefits of those 110 measures, the 20 billion pounds of business investment, uh, they aren't scored by and large by the OBR because most of them will feed through not in five years but within a decade. Uh, the full expensing will increase uh, by about 14 billion, the investment in the next five years, but the real benefits will be because uh, you know, companies like Toyota and Nissan say they want to build plants here because they can see the benefits in the medium and long term, 10, 20 years' time. And I think that what really matters is that despite all the political noise, governments find the nerve to make the long-term changes, the really difficult changes that will make a difference. Um, and, and that is what Rishi Sunak is absolutely committed to. It's what I'm absolutely committed to. And I think as long as we do that, then um, we have got the most amazing prospects in front of us. And 2030, it will be the most amazing economy. I think, you know, it is possible we will hand over a fantastic economy to Labour in 2030, yes. Okay, <laughs> on that note, thank you very much, Chancellor. Thank you.